Our text this morning is Philippians chapter 2, just two verses this morning, verses 3 and 4 of Philippians chapter 2. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for your holy word and for this time that we have as a body to look into it together. I thank you again for convicting me of the truths that are in this passage. I know there's not much new here, but I do appreciate you reminding me of things that I needed to hear. And I pray that if someone else here needs to hear this and and address issues in their own life through your help and through your word, Uh, that you would provide that conviction. I pray that you would help me to speak the truth in love and that you would use me this morning as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. Several years ago, there was an editorial cartoon which features big words carved out of granite. The words, I, me, mine, and myself stacked up in a pyramid And thousands of people drawn, standing before it with their arms raised and waved as if they were bowing down to what the words said. And the caption said, speaking of American cults. And the point of that, of course, I think is is obvious that that one of the... One of the things that we struggle with is, uh, is too much of a focus on ourselves that gets in the way of our relationship to the Lord and our relationship with others. Idolatry for us today is not like it was in the times of Scripture where we fashion weird little statues and we bow down to them. Most likely, our object of idolatrous affection in many cases can be ourselves. The essence of sin is when I choose to obey my own will, when I know that the will of God is different. So throughout Scripture, we are taught uh, that, that we ought not focus too much on ourselves, that it's, it is a danger, that it, does, it leads to neglect of God, it leads to harm in our relationships, it leads to unhealthy churches. We as, as a people and as individuals need to fight against the fleshly tendency to focus on ourselves. Now, the context of the passage that we're going to look at today, Paul is writing to his beloved church at Philippi. You have to love Paul. Paul is a prisoner. He is round the clock chained to someone else, and the the people keep uh, changing as as one leaves the shift and another one comes in, but Paul himself is round the clock chained to someone, and he's still, uh, he's, he's lost his freedom, but what is his concern? His concern is about the church's welfare. His concern is about the individual believers and how they are getting on with their relationship with the Lord. Kind of like the mother of a newborn will rejoice. Rejoice at the birth of her baby. And yet, deep down, for probably both parents, there is some anxiety about the future of this child and the responsibility of raising the child going forward. Well, Paul rejoiced greatly at the conversion of the Philippians in the church of that city, but he often has anxiety over their future. A lot of the letters that Paul wrote, uh, there was a lot of fussing involved and, and correction and chastisement to the people of the various places for the things that they were doing. But the book of Philippians is mostly joy and gratitude and commending them for their, uh, for their good works and for their faithfulness. But he knows that there are some enemies that are going to try to draw them away. He wants to encourage them to resist both collectively as a church and in individuals with respect to their attitude. So we're going to consider some key words and phrases that we find in these two verses. Let's begin that in verse 3. where He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Now, interestingly, the word do that appears in most English translations is not in the original Greek. As we're, if, if you read verse 2, it moves right on in without that word do. Verse 2 says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in, being in full accord and of one mind, nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Basically, he's telling them what should be. There should be nothing done among the brothers there of selfishness. Selfish ambition or conceit. Let nothing 
He's telling them, let nothing that you do be all about you. He's telling them that we need to continually examine our motives as any selfish move can be harmful in the things that we are doing. So if we, if we take that statement, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, we can, we can understand that if we flip it around and consider the opposite. Do everything with a mind to honor God. Everything with a focus on his glory, nothing with a focus on the promotion of ourselves. It's, it's not a matter of God gets one day a week and then we largely forget about him until such time comes as we meet together again on a Sunday because that's no way to live. And Paul tells them that do everything with a mind to honor God, do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, to specifically, what does he refer? Well, in verse 3, again, we, we, uh, we highlight these words, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Why does he need to tell us that? Because as has already been said, we have a tendency towards selfishness. That is our default. Uh, we are by default selfish, and it's so prominent in humanity that we need to, to fight against it. I remember when I first learned about air brakes on a school bus. And that was, uh, that was a few years ago. I was going to get a test to, so that I would be qualified to drive school bus a school bus with air brakes. One of the things that I always thought was, you know, I wonder about the emergency brakes. What happens when the compressor goes out? Does that mean you have no emergency brakes? Well, during the course of learning about this, I learned that, that it's, it's the presence, the functioning of the air compressor that is always pushing up against the emergency brakes, always keeping them up. So if the compressor goes out, that air will leak out, the brakes will fall down by default and stop the vehicle. I thought, oh. Well, there's a sermon in there somewhere, and that is you always need that air fighting up against the emergency brakes to always keep them up and out of the way so that the bus can move. We always need to be providing pressure against the selfishness that by default will show in our lives if we allow it to. That is, that was, that is our natural tendency. If we try nothing, then selfishness will just come naturally. We must fight and press against selfishness that is so prominent in our humanity. There are so many examples in Scripture of, of the selfishness of human nature, even among some of the most prominent people we find and we read about. Just a, just a couple of examples here. One comes from Luke chapter 20. It says, In the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts. Jesus is saying, don't be like that. That's selfish ambition. That's vain conceit. That is a focus upon oneself. The, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders to whom Jesus was always correcting, that was the problem. It was all about themselves. And so Jesus chastises them in front of his disciples. But regrettably, that lesson would not stick. Just a couple of chapters later, we have a stunning incident. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to read from Luke 22. Think about this. There are 24 chapters in Luke. So in Luke 22, that must be very late in the ministry of Jesus. After he spent three years with his disciples teaching them correcting them, rebuking them, setting a good example for him. Now, the scene for this passage we're about to look at in Luke chapter 22, it's in the upper room. It's already after Jesus has knelt down in front of every disciple to wash all of their feet. And he has given them a lesson about the greatest among you will be your servant. He has instituted the Lord's Supper for the very first time, which we partook just, just moments ago. He has announced... There is a betrayer among their midst. All of this happening, they're just weeks away from the founding of the New Testament church on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit coming down like tongues of fire and speaking in tongues and 3,000 becoming saved in one day. Just weeks away from that and we find this little incident in Luke chapter 22 beginning with verse 24. The dispute also rose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. 
And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. Now, we may marvel at this. I mean, the disciples, only weeks away from the founding of the church, the apostles, this is what they were doing, arguing about who would be the greatest. And yet we shouldn't. This is the default attitude of humanity if we do not constantly fight against it. Chuck Swindoll is a, is a man who's been around for many years, for decades, as a renowned preacher and author, and he's still on the radio uh, today, and, and uh, his, his sermons are, are very good, and he's, he's very transparent. And in the books in, that he writes and in the, in the sermons that he preaches, he's very open about his own failings, and I've, I've always appreciated about them. He, he tells a story, this happened years ago, about how he and his grown son were going to go to, they went to Oregon for a whitewater rafting trip. So while, his, while he was standing there with his son, there was a group of about 15, they were listening to the guide give instructions at the very beginning. Chuck Swindoll said, my eyes started to look around, and I was looking at the canoes. I noticed there were a couple of brand new canoes that were off to the left. And uh, nothing wrong with the other canoes, they were just old. And uh, I started to say to my son, Kurt, start moving over to the left. Why, Dad? Just do what I say. Move over to the left. So he worked it out to where they got the brand new canoes. He said there, there were different guides there. There was a salty old pro and there were a couple of younger guys that hadn't been doing it as long. He said, guess what? I manipulated my way into getting the salty old pro to be the head of my group. So I got to go with them. He said the following day, the group of 15, there, there were men from his church. The group of 15 men, they got into a, a van and they were going back and a tire blew out. To fix the tire required a lot of moving of equipment out, and, and it was dirty, sweaty work to change it. He said, guess who managed to find himself directing traffic on that night? He said, I don't recall that one car actually came through, but I was directing traffic. He, so he, he said, it wasn't until the day after that I realized how selfish I was being and how I was discipling my own son to be selfish right along with me. So... What, a, what an open and transparent way, and, and what a point that needs to be driven home to all of us. No one is immune to acting selfishly. We are all warned. We must all battle against it. Selfishness is destructive in the church, in marriages, in testimonies to unbelievers. It's, it's damaging in all manners of the Christian life. So Paul gives his two-part remedy uh, beginning in verse 3. It's what we should be what we should do. In verse 3, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. The cure all for the natural tendency of selfishness is lowliness of mind. That's what he calls us. That's what Jesus demonstrated for us. That's what Paul demonstrated for us. Humility, lowliness of mind. How? Well, this again takes us back to our study of the Beatitudes. Back in April, we remember who we are. We remember our position in relation to Christ and what was done for us. We remember that blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who understand their own spiritual poverty. That leads to mourning over one's own sin and being meek and gentle and humble and lowly of mind. That is the cure-all for the selfishness that afflicts us. Now, God never gets tired. Sometimes God describes himself in a way using human characteristics so that just we can relate to him. It says the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. God does not have eyes as we understand eyes. Well, in, in Isaiah chapter 65, God lists some things that are tiresome that he's dealing with with his people beginning in verse 2 of Isaiah 65 I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good following their own devices 
a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and broth of tainted meat is in their vessels. Now up to this point, much of that was written specifically to the Jewish people at that time, things which don't normally really apply to us. But in verse 5, he talks about people who say, Keep to yourself. Do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. Was this not the point of the story that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan? How, How it was the religious people who passed by. They made a point to cross the street to walk on the other side of the road so so as not to have to deal with the problem of the person who had uh, had fallen among thieves. Self-loving, self-promoting pride and arrogance, this is an affront to God and it is a danger to our souls. It was James who wrote in his letter, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Such grace is needed to obey what Paul tells us next there in verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. My first recollection of encountering this verse happened when I was in college. I was in Bible college. I was working at McDonald's, started as a freshman. And uh, there was a girl working there. She was about my age, and she knew absolutely everything. She wasn't a manager. She was just a, a scrub like I was. You know, taking the money, doling out the Big Macs, but she knew everything. She knew how she should do it, and she knew how you should do it, and, and I did not handle it very well. And I, uh, it was not obvious in my reactions to her that I was a Bible college student studying to be in, in the ministry. And uh, during that time, I was reading through Philippians, and, and the translation that I had at that time said, In humility, consider others better than yourselves. And that's when it hit me, like a, like a two by four. And so I made a point to go back and to be very nice to her and to be very gracious in replying when she told me what I already knew about how to do the job that I had already been trained to do. But I was, I was very nice and gracious and it really did soften her and it changed her attitude toward me. And I felt like it, it gave me a better testimony to the people with whom I was working there, but that's what Paul calls us to. He says in this translation, count others more significant than yourselves. Regarding others as more important than ourselves, that's not the default. The default is to be selfish. Me first. Uh, but, and it's difficult, but we have glorious examples again in Scripture of people who have done this. We know the story of Abraham and Lot who decided to give Lot the first choice of the land. Abraham was the uncle. He was the elder statesman, so to speak. By all rights, he could choose where he wanted to go and Lot would take the other one. That's not what he did. And we we covered this example when we talked about the Beatitudes. But he considered Lot more significant than himself and let him have the first choice. We talked about before communion this morning, Jesus in the garden praying. Who among us could go through what he did, looking ahead to the things that he would suffer as God himself, the Father, rejected him. But he regarded us as more significant than himself. John the Baptist, when his disciples came to him and said, hey, this Jesus has come along and he's drawing crowds and he's taking away some of your disciples. What shall we do? John the Baptist said, this is the way it is supposed to be. He must increase. I must increase. Decrease. Now, these are big, famous examples that have been mentioned here before. But the principle applies to us just in ordinary daily living to, as a general rule, to, to with intent, try to consider others more significant than ourselves. And in, in Paul in Ephesians talks about this principle as it applies to marriage. In Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 22, he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Now, what does he mean in short? He's saying, wives, count your husband as more significant than yourself. Paul does not stop there. This is not a one-sided passage in which Paul is writing. He goes on in verse 25, husbands. 
Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. In short, husbands, count your wife as more significant than yourselves. Paul calls us in everyday life, married, non-married, in everyday life to walk humbly, to fight against the selfishness that is the default, and to consider others as better than ourselves. One more word to focus on comes in verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. I've just highlighted the word look there. That word look is loaded. That same word look applies to both of these situations in this verse. It means to to focus on, to make it your aim. In the same way that you look to your own interests, with that same degree and that same intensity, look to the interests of of others. Now that's hard to do, but it reminds us of what Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Look and aim and look out for him to the same degree that you do for yourself. Notice he doesn't say ignore your own needs. Don't look out for yourself. We are required to. We have, we have jobs to do. We have families to raise. We have food to, uh, to procure and, and bills to pay. So we look at our own interests, but in the same way we look out for the interests of others. And the more that we learn to obey the principles that Paul has laid out in these two verses, the more we adopt the mind of Christ, which Paul goes on to explain in the verses right after. Right after he finishes verses two, verses 3 and 4, he goes into the description of Jesus himself, whom he is trying to get us to be like. Philippians 2, beginning with verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May the Lord help us to forsake and constantly fight against our default selfishness. May he help us to empty ourselves of pride and put on humility. And may he help us, like Jesus, to bring great glory to the Father. Let's ask him for his help now. Thank you again, Lord, for your, your words of instruction that we all need to hear. And I pray that you would help us to be distinctive as believers in Christ, as followers of Christ, that we would display an unselfishness that marks us out as being different, that makes it obvious that we have the Holy Spirit living and working inside of us. I pray for your help in this regard. Help us not to be selfish, but to give honor and glory to you. Thank you for the lessons that you teach us, and I pray that you'd help us to take them to heart and to spur one another on with encouragement to do good works and faithfulness and obedience to you. I pray for anyone who's here this morning, Lord, who has not received you as Lord and Savior, that you would help them to understand the urgency of this matter. Help us to minister to them in the way that you've called us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Every Sunday we offer an invitation, if you've not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, to come forward and express your desire to do so. We'll make arrangements to open the Word of God with you to discuss this very important matter. If you're a baptized believer, not a member of Calvary Christian Church, and you want to officially identify with this body, we invite you to come forward and express that to us as well, and we'll again make arrangements to meet with you and open the Word of God concerning this. If you have a spiritual need or something you'd like to share with us and about what you'd like us to pray, we invite you to come forward for that as well as we stand and sing our song of invitation this morning.